All right. So welcome everyone to Making It On Mondays, our weekly workshop for mums in the making. Now, Making It On Mondays is brought to you by the Acupuncture Pregnancy Clinic, which is an integrative traditional Chinese medicine clinic and an acupuncture clinic dedicated to reproductive health, to IVF support and to pregnancy care. Now, these weekly sessions are designed to help and support those on their fertility journey and are all about empowering women and men who are trying to conceive through providing weekly workshops with relevant and research-based resources. Now, in these weekly sessions, we cover topics such as TCM fertility, nutrition, mindset, as well as tips from the experts, both inside and outside of our clinic. Today, I am your host. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Louise Jeffrey. I'm a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. I'm an acupuncturist and I'm a coach. And I've been in practice helping couples trying to conceive since 2010. So today we have with us the wonderful Alex Middleton. Now, Alex is an experienced naturopathic nutritionist with over 10 years experience in helping women to optimize their hormones, their fertility, and their reproductive health. And her special mission is to show women with endometriosis how to get their quality of life back through the combined power of natural, environmental, and conventional medicine. Welcome, Alex. It's so lovely to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. Now, Alex, I know your approach is grounded in the principles of both naturopathic and evidence-based medicine, and that you are passionate about incorporating the latest research into your clinical practice, including, of course, your own research work with NICM, which is the Nat National Institute of Complementary Medicine. And I also know that you work extensively with the Australian medical community and that you are a passionate advocate for the natural medicine industry. And this is more specifically through your work with um, ATMS, the Australian Traditional Medicine Society. So today we're going to be talking about endometriosis and we're going to cover the topic of endometriosis and fertility. And we're gonna be talking about the top five things that you need to know to enhance your chances of conceiving if you have endometriosis. So let's jump in. Now, Alex, I know that you see uh, endometriosis a lot in your clinic, um, and we do too at the Acupuncture Pregnancy Clinic. And we see a lot of women in debilitating pain. We see women with very heavy periods. Um, you know, some women are asymptomatic, and I think you mentioned a statistic of around 20 to 25 percent, but around mm -hmm. 70 to 70, 75 percent of women have really bad pain, and some of them have pain all through their cycle. And sometimes the only option that they're actually given is surgery or perhaps hormones, right? But we know mm -hmm. that these can have side effects too. Now, we know that most of them respond well to surgery, but the downside is it's really quite invasive. And generally, the endo comes back after six or eight months. So I know right. you've spent okay. a lot of time. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, it can also make the endo worse. It's the nature of cutting into skin. You're always going to run the risk of creating more scar tissue which can create adhesions and organs to stick together and make the endo worse as well and make things like implantation a lot harder. Yes, yes, because yeah. of the scarring. Do you right. see that a lot in your clinic, Alex? Yeah, I mean, doctors really only can offer anti-inflammatory or hormonal medications. The gold standard for diagnosis is still a laparoscopy. But the, the trend that I'm noticing, particularly this year, and particularly in Sydney, is that the younger women are getting more and more turned away because the research shows that really it's only ovarian or deep infiltrating endometriosis, which accounts for about 30% of all cases, which is actually truly assisted by laparoscopies. Um, the other 70% of women that have peritoneal endometriosis, so more superficial endometriosis, the studies have shown that it's not as useful. And again, it can create more problems, particularly if it's done repetitively. You know, a lot of women... I've met someone that's had 12 laparoscopies in 15 years. Wow. Um, and she's with, she's with fertility now. So, you know, I actually, I, I really urge my clients to surgery is an absolute last resort. Um, the better way to approach it and also the better way to, you know, to enhance your fertility is to address the different underlying drivers that can fuel the disease to, to egg on. And, the research is there, but for whatever reason, the doctors aren't, you know, quite up to date on it or it hasn't been written to the national medical guidelines. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I go through. And there's a lot of stuff you can do naturally. A lot of the stuff, you know, you need to get a referral to a specialist. 
whether it's a gynae or a fertility specialist or an endocrinologist. And so what I find is by working with the, you know, and then in, in the um, allied health board, obviously, you know, your side of medicine, I work a lot of, with physios, particularly pelvic health physios, you know, other types of natural therapists um, to make sure everything is being ticked off the list. So the woman with endo, the, the internal environment is in the best possible place it can be that will allow for a healthy pregnancy and implantation to go ahead. And so, and it's a bit of a tick list. And so I work with diet, you know, di and diet is useful. And a lot of people have heard of, you know, cutting out things like dairy and gluten, which are inflammatory. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and inflammation is a big part of the disease. Um, you know, but there are other things that, especially if you're trying to get pregnant in the endo that you need to consider, the, the top food group that I think makes the biggest difference is a group called biological amines. Um, a lot of women might have heard about histamine and by cutting out foods that are really high in those amines, you can basically cut the cycle of histamine, which inside the body fuels estrogen. Um, mm. And that high estrogen state can contribute to the disease getting worse. And, you know, conversely, the, it's a bit of a chicken and, egg, chicken and egg cycle because once your estrogen's high, it stimulates mast cells in your body to release even more histamine. And yes. so one way you can break that cycle is by following a low amine or what some people know as a low histamine diet. And what kind of amines? Amine, so a lot of those foods, anything, and amine is a protein that's aged and um, and come apart. So the top of the top of the list is probably anything fermented, which the media is very busy mm. telling everybody that they should have lots of fermented foods for their gut health. Mm. Um, wow. But, you know, there's not one diet for for a whole, you know for everybody. Everybody's unique in their makeup, and with women with endo, you know, cutting those amines. That's a fermented anything that's fermented, and that includes fermented alcohols like wine and beer. But you know, yeah. even things like the vinegar on your salad, right? So just by swapping something like vinaigrette for lemon and olive oil is going to help you reduce your load. Um, but also, there are lots of natural foods which are you know really high in amines. So stuff like dried fruit, especially dates. Bananas, avocado, unfortunately. Um, what else is there? Broccoli, kale, mushrooms, eggplant, um, and to a smaller extent, citrus and tropical fruits. And everybody's different with how they react to it. I usually test someone's histamine before they eliminate stuff for a few months. And what most people will find is that they, after eight, 12 weeks off them strictly, is that they can identify, they can slowly reintroduce stuff and identify, because those amines will also fuel things like you know, pain, fatigue in particular, but also stuff mm -hmm. like anxiety, depression, which is known, you know, wow. known symptoms, sorry. Um, insomnia is another one, restless legs, another random one. And so <clears throat> those symptoms dramatically get better at the same time. And so, so you can stop, it's one small thing of stopping endo in its tracks. And so most people can tolerate certain things in small amounts. So instead of eating two avocados a day, a lot of women can go back to eating a quarter a day and have no issues. But if they no, were to wow. have to, it's very individual. Um, and then with other it's foods. In those foods, isn't it? And being able to say, look, these are the foods and doing them in really, you know, very, very small amounts or not at all. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I like people to come off them for eight weeks and then to reintroduce them because for me, you know, also really restrictive eating is also stressful and that's the last thing you want when you're trying to get pregnant. It has to be a balance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and some women to de-stress need a cup, you know, a glass of organic red wine at some point. <laughs> we all yes. and so but if that's super affecting you and you're trying to get pregnant, it's not a good decision. So mm. it, yeah, it's about, you know, mm. risk benefit, who you are individually and stuff like that. Um dairy and glutens, you know, most people are on top of, but then also things like you know, caffeine, which is pretty well documented in, you know, the trying to get pregnant research world. But the thing with caffeine when it comes to having endo and trying to get pregnant, caffeine will over time make you burn through your adrenal hormones. And what that means is when your adrenal hormones essentially are the main ingredients for progesterone. And progesterone, if I had to pick one hormone that's the most important for you to get pregnant and to be at a good level, um, it would be it. And in women with endometriosis, that they generally either run low or they've got enough, but that that total amount of progesterone isn't actually having the effect it should be. It's called progesterone resistance. Resistance, sorry. So, <clears throat> getting the progesterone up is a really big part of it. Um, and so, with caffeine, 
when you're drinking caffeine, particularly coffee, which is pretty quite intense and high in amines if it's not organic, um, what you do is you burn through your adrenal hormones and that can theoretically lower your progesterone. And if your progesterone is going down, um, progesterone keeps estrogen in check and the estrogen metabolites, which fuel, fuel endo, can then get up and your disease, it can contribute to that too. So avoiding you know, caffeine, well, I, I love caffeine, but trying to, not, being off coffee is a good idea if you, you know, you're know you trying to get pregnant. Having a cup of Earl Grey after some food or green tea is way better. You get a little bit of caffeine, you get the benefits of the tea itself. Um, yeah, it's a much better choice. And so and alcohols are, you know, you see, you know, yeah, and alcohol. studies on that for sure. Yeah. And, and how about how these um, affect the, the vaginal microbiome? Um, you know, do the amines play a part in that or is that something? No, um, what I would say is, you know, if I was to run through, you know, one of the most important things to get screened for with someone who knows what they're doing and you'd be amazed at how many doctors don't because, again, this stuff isn't written to the national guidelines, is to make sure that you are screened efficiently for gynecological infections that can contribute to, well, A, endo, B, um, just infertility generally or negative pregnancy outcomes, you know, miscarriage and stillbirth, things like that. You know, stuff like in particular genital mycoplasmas like urea plasma, for example, um, they aren't part of the general standardised screening. You need a PCR vaginal swab to check it. And if you have it, it's a site. There are no symptoms, it's, um, but you will need antibiotics. And if you don't, if you don't clear that infection, one of the biggest things I see with genital mycoplasmas is, is, you know, women who have gone through recurrent miscarriage. And sometimes when they have the antibiotics, they do more of the working on themselves, then they get pregnant on their own. They don't actually need assistance. So, you know, things so like that. You would run, run that test with your, with your patient? Yeah, so one of the standard tests, I've probably got five standard tests that I, I do with everyone with endo and particularly with women with endo trying to get pregnant. Um, and one of those is a vaginal microbiome swab that's a private test and you can do it at home and then I get the results. And that tells me everything that's going on vaginally. So good and bad bacteria and you know, having good levels of good bacteria is super important for fertility outcomes no matter who you are. Um, it checks screens for all sorts of infections including, you know, fungal infections, bacterial, viral, etc. cetera. Um, you know, and as well as the gynecological one, we're checking always, always checking the gut, right? Because your gut controls your immune system. Eighty percent of your immune cells is made in your gut, and if there's something in your gut annoying it, like an infection, whether it's parasitic or bacterial or fungal, the gut is going to be inflamed. And you know, part of endometriosis, particularly with um, with bacteria, there is a hypothesis where thing called lipopolysaccharides so a, bact a bacteria that a gram negative bacteria it leaks from your stomach through the peritoneal cavity and contributes to the development of endo so getting your gut in a really good place is important and just as a side note especially with parasites and people living on the east coast in australia um they're they're missed constantly by gps people go on holiday to the south pacific and thailand and bali and india and they have barley belly or traveler's diarrhea and the doctor either they either catch it on a test and they're just given flagell and told that that's enough, which it's generally not, or um, they haven't done the right test and they miss it altogether when they just do a culture and they look under a microscope and they don't they just miss it. So that's a really common story too. Um, and clearing, making sure you know, fungus is a natural part of the microbiome, but making sure it's kept in check is important with someone with endo, particularly someone trying to get pregnant because. High um, candida, let me get this right, uh, estrogen, high estrogen states, which everyone with endo has, suppresses the immune cells that keeps candida in check. So a lot of women have recurrent thrush, for example, which can hinder, you know, preconception care and getting pregnant. And a lot of women with endo, they always get it just before ovulation or just before their period. And they think it's about eating too much sugar or their gut health or whatever. But actually, it's more about their estrogen state and how well or not well, their liver is able to, you know, get rid of those estrogen byproducts um, yes. through the gut. Mm -hmm. So infections, yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much that, that I'm even learning today while I'm sitting here with you, um, you know, and we, we're utilising more acupuncture Chinese herbs and, and obviously some diet and lifestyle factors, but just hearing you talk about, 
you know, the microbiome and, and going into the amines. I mean, that's that's just something straight away if somebody suspects they have endo, even if they, they don't and they've been trying to conceive for a long time and they might be asymptomatic, obviously worthwhile, you know, regardless of whether you go and have a laparoscopy, coming to speak to someone like you and saying, right, let's let's just check all of this. You know, it's yeah, really and worth really I'd be really careful about Googling lists for amines because there are a lot of, there's a lot of bad information that's strictly on amines on Google. And listen, there isn't a lot of research linking things like amines, histamine, estrogen, and endo. There's bit, almost nothing. But mm -hmm. like in my research paper last year, what I tried to explain was the stuff that really is evidence-based, like dairy foods being not great for endo. One mm -hmm. of the ways it could be fueling it is most dairy foods, apart from, you know, the issues with lactose and casein, a lot of dairy foods are fermented, like yogurt, for example, or they're okay. moldy in age, like the aged cheeses, and therefore you're getting this high histamine thing. So it is there. The research just takes a while to catch up. And what about organic dairy? Just quickly, because I know we'll, we'll move on in a moment. Um, so dairy with women with endo, some women tolerate it, some women don't at all. All women with endo should be off cow-based dairy products, excepting organic salted butter. That's fine most mostly for everybody. Mm -hmm. Tiny amounts okay. of casein. Um, for the people that do like a little bit of dairy and can tolerate it, um, I would stick to sheep, goat, um, buffalo. Buffalo is probably the safest. So when you're thinking about cheese, you're thinking about, you know, sheep or goats feta or buffalo mozzarella or Meredith is a really great brand if you if you do want to still have a little bit of yogurt. Yes. I do try and get, if, it, if someone's trying to get pregnant, I actually really do try and get them a little bit of buffalo mozzarella and cow's butter and that's basically it or maybe a little bit of goat's cheese. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, but yogurt and creams and, and particularly anything to do with cow's milk is just um, not good. Far away to stimulate your endosynthesis. Okay, that's beautiful. Thank you. So we've talked about diet. We've talked about the vaginal microbiome. What were the other things you wanted to share? Um, you know, your top five. Oh, top five. Well, like I said to you before the interview, it's probably a hundred. But if I had to pick some, um, a bit. I think the summary of when you're endo and you're trying to get pregnant. The way you enhance that is you is the same way you help your endo, right? So you've got to address all the things that could be possibly driving your endo. So we talked a little bit about microbiomes and infections and stuff. Hormone imbalance is another really, really big part of it. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you know, digestive function and stuff like that. The environmental piece is absolutely huge. It's something that isn't talked about and is absolutely present in the research. Thousands of mm -hmm. papers on the different ways, small, tiny chemicals in your house and your or your office um, or at work could be actually, you know, accumulating levels and contributing to your endo. So probably the biggest thing I see that fuels endo symptoms in Sydney, particularly with the last 12 months of rain, is mould, right? So everyone, the houses in Sydney on the East Coast are built on sandstone and clay and they're not particularly, you know, the roofs aren't particularly well built. So a lot of people have water damage in their houses or at work which yes. makes you know, the perfect environment if people don't know how to manage it properly for mould and other microtoxins to develop. And, you know, mould and microtoxins, one in five people um, who breathe in the air around mould and the microtoxins they give off, unlike the, the other four in five people, they can't breathe them out. And women, if I, you know, a lot of women, it's actually a genetic SNP. Um, and one of the common commonalities of women with endo is they're just generally not getting good at getting rid of, rid of stuff genetically, right? Yes. And yeah. So the stuff that other people can detox, okay, endo women can't and it adds up and contributes to the pathophysiology of the disease. So stuff like, so mould, and mould isn't just in your house, mould can be on particularly in foods like non-organic coffee and peanuts. Um, oh, you know, know that. Stuff, oh, yes, yep. Um parabens which is mainly you know non-organic food i know organic food is expensive and it's better that you again you have to pick your battles um but really if you've got endo if you've got endo trying to get pregnant any sort of endo you know mm -hmm. reducing your chemical load pesticides in particular you know with non-organic foods parabens and non-organic foods and, and cosmetics dioxins are mainly in non-organic animal products and um seafood, but also things like cigarettes and air pollution. Um, there, just a side note on seafood, if you're trying to get pregnant, you know, there, there's not a lot of research on fertility and stuff, but there is a lot of research on the ocean at the moment. And even if you buy the best quality wild fish, it might not be treated with antibiotics, like say something like farm salmon, 
but it's likely to be loaded with microplastics. And if it's a big fish like tuna, um, you know, or shark or swordfish, you know, those guys are really, you know, rich in heavy metals like mercury, which can contribute to fertility issues as well. And so I think it sounds really extreme, but I think if you've got endo and you're trying to get pregnant and you really want to do the absolute best to minimise your exposures, you really have to think, is seafood worth it for me? Mm -hmm. And listen, if you're a vegan or a vegetarian that wants to try some more, for more protein, which is super important, um, yeah, you know, some wild white fish two or three times a week is probably a better choice than nothing. <laughs> but if okay. you're eating other animals' proteins like lamb or, you know, organic poultry, for example, um, you might not need to worry so much about fish and fish oil and things like that. And just as another side note, fish, most of the fish oils around town, even the practitioner-only ones, aren't filtering for microplastics. So <clears throat> that's not something I've I've heard of before. It's so interesting. You know, we talk about all the, the different the toxins like mercury, et cetera, et cetera. And there's so much stuff on that, but I've never really heard once any mention of microplastics in the ocean. Yeah. So that's well, an interesting point. Yeah, you've always got to think about what you're eating and what it was exposed to. What was what was the animal that you're eating? What was it eating? What was on that food? Because all all together it accumulates. And that's why things like a lot of people are pro organ meats for trying to get pregnant, right? Yes. Um, yes. like things like, you know, liver pâtés, you know, the liver is the place, they say it's full of nutrients. It's also the place that's like the primary place of getting rid of toxins. Oh, of <laughs> so oh, it's probably a not a good idea to be eating organ meats if you're trying to get pregnant, if that's the, even if it's organic, I've, you know, there's a big question mark around it. So, you know, and then other things, we talked about microplastics also, you know, in the water, also in actual plastic, right? And just yes. because something BPA, BPS, which most people have replaced BPA with, has been shown in quite a bit of research to be even worse than BPA. Um, you know, clean, clean beauty products in Australia, it's not a regulated term. If you ever want to see what's in your products, check out the EWG Skin Deep database and literally wow. hold the makeup wow. ingredient and type in the ingredients. And if anything's really above a rating of three and you'll see the little meters for immune toxicity and reproductive toxicity come up, I wouldn't be using it at all. And so you go to play. Tell them, did you say it was EWG? EWG Skin Deep database. Wow, um, okay. It's as good as you get for checking, um, which limits you with products, right? And so you've got to start thinking, well, what am I using? Do I really want to be wearing makeup when no one's around? Maybe I can give my skin a break today, right? Mm -hmm. what, what deodorant am I using if it's not a natural deodorant? It's full of aluminium. So there's this mm -hmm. huge list that I run through with clients. So environmental, um, <clears throat> stress we talked about um, mm -hmm. and, you know, the depletion of, of hormones and how that doesn't help progesterone. A couple of other things I would mention are, well, so obviously I work a lot with naturopathic prescriptions and um, how, what were we talking about? How endo affects your eggs in particular? So what a lot of people aren't aware of, so I told you those three types of endometriosis, superficial ovarian and deep infiltrating. Mm -hmm. And with ovarian, which your doctor probably tells you you've got chocolate cysts or endometriomas, and if they if they operate on, you know, to remove those, which they very often do because they can be extremely painful, um, a couple of things happen. One, just the nature of operating, you can lose eggs, right, and your ovarian reserve slash AMH can go down. Yes. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can get scar tissue from that, so that can affect the ovary's ability to produce eggs as well, as can hormonal imbalances. Um, endometriomas themselves sitting in there with the egg will, always, will generally, according to the research, decrease egg quality. And listen, your, they say <clears throat> your egg quality is kind of set from when you were born and your eggs, that their DNA integrity was decided on when they existed inside your mother's ovary as your mother grew as a fetus inside her mother. So all the environmental factors that your maternal grandmother was exposed to in a way dictates the health of the eggs that you were born with, right? In my generation, my grandmother, you know, she was in her early 20s smoking and drinking scotch in World War II, which was also when, you know, they had a huge manufacturing production of two, 3,000 of, of the first big lot of chemicals on the planet. So, um, so surgery and ovaries we talked about, 
the fluid from the follicles in women with endo has also been found to block eggs from maturing. Um, yes. It tends to happen from free radicals occurring in the egg itself, which damages the DNA and then it prevents fertilization. Um, the inflammatory molecules and even antibodies that are found in endo, um, well, common in endo, I should say, can also prevent fertilization. They can prevent implantation. And I think I read somewhere it can actually, if they can kill off the sperm. Um, so it's so not actually just about the, because, we, you know, most people will say it's generally about the environment in which the embryo is going to implant. So obviously the lining, but it's about so much more. Is what you're oh, saying. So it's, it's about so much more than your doctor's saying. I mean, even the the seminal fluid, so the fluid that the sperm sits in, right? It's men are really annoying because you know they can completely regenerate their sperm and seminal fluid in two or three months. Yeah. And the seminal fluid is like is has its own microbiome, right? And you can clean that up, but if it's not cleaned up you know, the, our, the woman's immune system can basically reject it. So there are all these other factors. The male side always has to be looked at. Um, you know, That's really so, interesting as well that, you know, yeah. that the male side can be affected by, by the endometriosis. And, and, again, that's something that, that is never really talked about, right? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that the male side is affected by endometriosis. I would say that the dysfunctional immune system that underpins endometriosis combined with not so healthy sperm and seminal fluid is not a good recipe for trying to get pregnant. Um, so wow. it needs to be both sides. Um, what else can I talk to about? In terms of proving eggs, I mean, there's always supplementation. Ubiquinol is definitely my go-to. Yes. Um, and that's yeah. for, that's for, that's for women with endo, and also women with endo trying to get pregnant, and anyone trying to get pregnant. And to be honest, almost anyone do, does well on six hundred milligrams of high quality. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so for those who don't know, ubiquinol is activated CoQ10. Um, it's particularly useful for women who who with decreased, you know, lower AMH, mm -hmm. ovarian, you know, lower ovarian reserves and stuff too. Um, it's a witty enhancer, isn't it? So it helps the, the powerhouse of the cells. Am yeah, I right? exactly. And then, you know, the, the, my naturopathic prescriptions are pretty um, individual, but things like inositol, vitamin C, vitamin E, liposomal glutathione, I uh, wouldn't be taking any of, especially the glutathione, I wouldn't take it without, you know, um, someone like me aiding you because it's quite sure a yeah. big detox yeah. effect. Exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> So they can all help improve egg quality. In terms of what your IVF doctor might recommend, just as a side note again, most IVF doctors don't have any nutritional training, right? Um, and they don't understand how different nutrients interact and they don't understand how sometimes even bioidentical hormones can affect people with very individual issues. So someone with endo, for example, goes to an IVF clinic and let's say they've got, you know, tied adrenal glands or adrenal insufficiency, which is a pretty common picture that I see, like mm. we were talking about before. And so the fertility specialists will recommend, you know, DHEA, for example, which will not only, you know, it's linked to, to more positive pregnancy outcomes can, can help eggs, but DHEA, like I said at the beginning, is one of the main ingredients for sex hormones. And it's not just progesterone, it's also estrogen. So women with endo, you know, the doctors are thinking that they're helping with DHEA, and it's not everyone, but some women yeah. who take the endo that take DHEA, it can actually upregulate the production of estrogen, which is going to make the endo worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got to be, so their energy and their clarity of mind and their mood can get better, but actually over time the endo symptoms might actually get worse. So that's one to look out for. The other one, low-dose melatonin, often prescribed. If you've got any sort of mental history background like anxiety and depression which women with endo very often do i'd be very careful with melatonin no matter who you are um okay. yeah so a lot of um a lot of women so women with mental health histories that take melatonin not all the time but sometimes it can actually make them feel more depressed the next day so yeah. um cool. even at low doses like two milligrams or whatever wow. um, okay. Yeah, so you've got to be careful with that. Um, I'm obviously anything that reduces oxidative stress, the environmental exposures, promotes estrogen clearance, reduces inflammation, um, reduces any sort of um, microbe overload, like with those infections, is going okay. to help anything that any so anything's going to help endo. Um, my top, I love curcumin, proteolytic enzymes are right up there too. Quercetinase, which helps reduce your your histamine. 
Um, and then making sure the one thing that most of my clients are very often missing that makes them feel better instantly is adequate protein, um, particularly yeah. in the morning. Yeah. And if you have endo or any other chronic disease, the guidelines are 1.5 grams of protein per kilo of body it's weight. And for most women, that's a lot. No, it <laughs> um, is, and it's difficult because it's got a high satiety, right? So you you really feel quite satisfied on that much protein. Yeah. But the body yeah. actually needs it. It really, really does. And I think we, we see yeah. this in lots of autoimmune conditions as well. Yeah. Um, and so so uh, with pro getting a good like 20 grams of protein before 9 o'clock can totally, apart from endo and fertility, can actually set your day up to be your mood, your blood sugar, your energy consistency. Um, I often get my clients onto a particular shake. I would, as a note, say please avoid whey protein. Whey protein is particularly inflammatory. Go for a vegan protein like rice or pea or pumpkin seed there's a whole lot of different ones and if you want some brand suggestions feel free to show me send me a message on instagram or email um okay. so they're the, the but i think it's important for people to know that i think they you know these are all great supplements and they're fantastic but i think that you know anyone who's been trying to conceive for longer than a few months really kind of needs to sit down with a naturopath or you know someone like yourself mm -hmm. and and have all the tests done to see you know what's missing and what's needed because we don't yeah. want to over supplement or under supplement on anything yeah and um, you want the right ones and also yep. a lot of the over-counter yep. ones you know they're they're retail supplements for a reason and if you look at a lot of the brands like the very famous brands i won't name them <laughs> um, i'll get in trouble uh, you know a lot of them half of them are what you think you're getting and half of them are think i think called binder and preservatives just to bind it up which just gives the liver more work what you want is strong targeted pure supplements that's which are prescription only and that's what you're only going to get from a naturopath right at the end of the day they're yeah. the ones who have the knowledge around those those supplements yeah. but alex i'm really conscious of time and i've um <laughs> i told you, you. <laughs> yeah, I know, and i know it's such a, such a deep, rich topic there's there's so much i know we could talk for a full hour probably even an hour and a half um and um, I just want to say thank you because you have such a wealth of knowledge and I, and I really believe that your approach can offer women with endo a much better chance, you know, at living pain-free and, and having a happy, healthy pregnancy. And also I think that sense of empowerment around endometriosis because a lot of it is very much around um, the fact that a lot of women with endometriosis are just kind of left by the wayside. Oh, we you know, we could do a bit of hormones or a bit of surgery or whatever, but there's there's not much else offered when you when you see a specialist or a doctor. So yeah, it's beautiful yeah. for us to tell our audience today that you know that if that if you suspect or you know that you've got endometriosis, mm -hmm. you know, seeing someone like yourself in particular who's um, who's a specialist in endo. Um, I hope that this has been helpful for everybody. But uh, before we wrap up, Alex, I mm -hmm. wanted to just where can people find you? I know you've got yeah. you've got your program, which is Con Conquer Endo yeah. Natural. So, and where can uh, yeah, so my website's alexandramiddleton.com.au. On there are all my services. I have a free guide to getting diagnosed with endo if you think you might have it. Um, and sort of questions to ask the doctors and the correct tests to get done. Um, like Louise mentioned, I've got a five-month Conquer Your Endo Naturally program, which a lot of women end up doing for a lot longer than five months because they get so much out of it. Um, on Instagram, I'm alexmnutrition feel free to send me a message on there if you like. And, yeah, and I just, I just like to finish with saying if you are trying to get pregnant, particularly if you're doing fertility treatment and it's not happening, you know, talk to your dog and, and you've got no symptoms like pain and fatigue or heavy periods or anything like that, no classic endo symptoms, ask them to screen you anyway for endo and make sure, you know, they've done it properly, a deep endometrial ultrasound, they've checked particularly for a thing with CA125 in the blood because it's it's 20, 25% of it's missed. It's silent. Wow. And you don't want to go through IVF, you know, five, That's ten cycles. Waste, isn't it? Yeah. 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 No. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much. I hope that this has been helpful for everyone. I hope that you found it as interesting as I have. Um, if there's any questions or if there's anything you'd like to say, let us know in the comments box. If you'd like to know more, um, alexmiddleton.com and you can visit her Instagram um, and next week we'll be back at around the same time uh, so tune in then we will be posting this week what that next topic will be and that's it for today thank you Alex so much thanks having me